So what I did is I wanted to know what most investors were thinking back then. So I sent my nephew to the library. He looked on Microfish. If you're under 30, you'll have to Google what that is. And I said, I want to see, I want every reference you can find to gold and silver. He spent three days looking at Microfish at the library. And I'm going to, he came back with a bunch of quotes. I'm just going to have them read some of you, uh, some of these quotes real quick, okay? All right, it's great to be back with everybody. I'm glad to be here live. It's so exciting. I'm glad each of you came out. Uh, this is going to be fun. I hope you have some fun. I'm going to have some fun. So, yes, I work with Mike Maloney at goldsilver.com. And I'm going to carry on with my speaking tradition and throw out some silver coins to those who can guess the correct answers to some questions I have for you. So we're going to have fun and see what happens here. So, uh, And by the way, these are Pegasus coins. Mike actually had his team. It was inspired by Mike, and uh, he had his team develop them. They're not even available on our website right now, but they're one-ounce silver coins. They're beautiful. Uh, so try to get the right answer. See if you can get some. Okay, and here we go. So for those who don't know me, my dad was actually a prospector, uh, more as a hobby, not at the level these guys next door are doing, but he was a gold and silver prospector. He uh, retired early, moved to California, and... Um, uh, from that first time he saw that little gold nugget in the bottom of the pan, he was hooked. Uh, he became pretty good at it. He was pretty prolific. He actually won some gold panning contests. Yes, there are such things. And he um, got so good at it that he was part of a group that would be hired, that when you bought a new metal detector, you would hire this group, and they would, gar they would show you how to use your metal uh, detector, and they would guarantee that you would find gold with it the first time out when they'd show you how to use it. And he always came through. It was a lot of fun. So I learned a lot from him. So here's our first coin. So if you discover gold in Australia, where should you look for silver? Who said Australia? Yeah, there you go. Come get it. Come get your coin. Australia, of course, that's where you should look for it, right? Okay, so let's deal with the elephant in the room. Can you catch? All right. What the heck is going on with silver? What is happening with silver? <laughs> the price has been falling, and yet we have all these major catalysts happening, and the price is falling. This is a one-year chart of silver, um, about 13 months, actually. And you can see it's fallen about 22% over the past year, and yet we have all these major catalysts surrounding us. It should be going higher, right? That's what we would all expect. So let's deal with this head on, shall we? There's three things I want you to know about that. First of all, if we understand silver's DNA, its DNA is it goes from boring to boring to boom. That's what it does. That's its DNA. If we understand that, we'll understand what I'll call its VPP, its volatility profit potential. Okay? This chart shows every spike in silver, all the major spikes in silver, since the mid-1970s, okay? And you can see there was a dozen of them, <clears throat> and I documented all of them. So these aren't bull markets. These are just spikes in the silver price, okay? And there they are, 144%, 743%, 79%, 50 36 84 90 123 80 176%, And last year, the silver price rose from its low to high 145%. And all of those happen, by the way, in 12 months or less. In 12 months or less. This is what silver does, okay? It goes from boring to boring to boom. So our job is what? Prepare for the next one. That's what our job is. So the message from that is let's not get discouraged as silver investors before the next spike kicks in because history is very clear in this point. Another spike in the silver price is coming, all right? This is the time between all those spikes I just showed you. And you notice they're all measured in years, all of them, okay? So if we take out the bear markets, the spikes that occurred during bear markets, all right? The average between the spikes is two and a half years. That's what the average is between all those big spikes is two and a half years for bull markets. So the message is don't get discouraged because another one's gonna come, all right? 
So where's the next spike going to take us? If you talk to technical analysts, most chart people will say, okay, silver's not really at a breakout level till it breaks through $30, okay? So all those spikes I just showed you, when silver breaks out of 30, where's it going to? So if it matched any of the prior spikes, this is what the price would run to, 73 and 73. That's the, okay, great, thank you. If it matched any of the prior spikes, that's the price that silver run to on its next spike, if it matched any of them, okay? So if we, again, if we take out the bear market spikes and we just look at the bull market spikes, Every single price up there would be over $50 for the next run. Every single one, if it matched those, okay? So, let's see if it works. There we go. Number two, this has happened before. This has happened before. What is happening right now has happened before. We've seen this movie before. This is a silver price from 1974 to 1976, and look what happened. It fell 43% over a two-year period of time. And what was going on at the time? We had, they had rising inflation back then. They had inflation higher, official inflation, higher back then than we have now. The high unemployment, there was a recession, an energy crisis had just kicked in, and that's not even the whole list. There were political concerns, there were geopolitical concerns. There was a whole laundry list of catalysts that should have been pushing, pushing silver higher. And yet, what did it do for over two years? It fell. Does this sound familiar? We're surrounded by catalysts right now, and yet the silver price is falling. We've seen this before, and I think most people in this room know how this story is going to end, okay? How that story ended, all right? So what I want to do is talk about you kooks, you people that think silver's going to $50, you think silver's going to $100, or whatever you think. You're all a bunch of kooks, all right? And back then in 1976, this is the gold and silver chart from 1976. There were some kooks back then that thought silver was going to $20. They thought silver was going to $30. Some had the audacity to say silver's going to $40. Look at the silver price, it was $4. They were actually claiming and predicting that you could add a zero to your investment back in 1976. But most people back then weren't kooks. Most people, what did they think about silver and gold? Okay, so one of you on each side of me here. So what I did is I wanted to know what most investors were thinking back then. So I sent my nephew to the library. He looked on Microfish. If you're under 30, you'll have to Google what that is. <laughs> and I said, I want to see, I want every reference you can find to gold and silver. He spent three days looking at Microfish at the library. And I'm gonna, he came back with a bunch of quotes I'm just going to have them read some of you, uh, some of these quotes real quick, okay? Now, as they read each number out, I want you to look at where the gold and silver price is as they read these out. Okay, you're, you are, no, you are. Kira Penny. <laughs> Steve Penny. Steve Penny with Silver Chartist. Okay, you ready? Here we go. We're going to go fast. Watch the silver price. Number one, New York Times. The party seems to be over for gold and silver. Number two, New York Times. Mr. Heim has had so much fun twitting about gold bugs, he's turning his clients to put their money into treasury bills. Number three, New York Times. From a gold dealer in Zurich. It's a seller's market. No one is buying gold. Number four, Time Magazine. Gold recovered to $111, but that is a dismal figure, figure for gold bugs who not long ago were forecasting prices of $300 or more. They had the audacity to predict gold was going to $300. Number five, Time Magazine, the economic conditions that triggered the gold and silver boom of 1973 through 1974 have largely disappeared. They've disappeared. Sell your gold and silver. Number six, New York Times, Mr. Heim predicts gold will go below $100. Oops, that never happened. Number seven, New York Times, there is simply nothing in the economic picture today to cause a rush into gold and silver. Avoid them and avoid gold stocks. Avoid them. <laughs> <laughs> Number eight from Citibank. Gold was an inflation hedge in the early 70s, but now dollars are a gold hedge. Dollars are a gold hedge. All hail the mighty dollar. I looked up the dollar lost 26% of its purchasing power from the date of that comment to 1980. 26% of its purchasing power. 
Number nine, New York Times, private American purchases of gold, once it was legalized at the end of 1974, never materialized on a large scale. If the gold bugs have been routed, special credit falls on the victorious dollar. The victorious dollar, yeah. A lot of people were confused back then. Why isn't gold and silver going up? They just legalized gold in the U.S. back then. Why isn't it going up? And number 10 here, New York Times. Some experts, even those with good records in gold and silver trading, declare it's still too early to buy bullion. Don't buy bullion. Uh, don't be a contrarian. Number 11, New York Times, quoting Lawrence Helm. Gold is headed below $100. Who wants to put money in gold and silver now? I do. <laughs> number 12, New York Times, quoting a Mr. Holt. Gold and silver prices got too far ahead of themselves due to intense speculation. It's always the speculators that drive the price down. Number 13, New York Times, quoting author Elliot Janeway. Any argument against putting your trust in gold goes double for silver. Silver is fool's gold. Ah, there it is, ladies and gentlemen. Silver is fool's gold. Here, you guys want a Pegasus? Catch the... <laughs> there you go. That's what was being said about gold and silver in 1976. Okay? So, what do you think? Were they right? Were they all right? Let's pull back a little bit, shall we, and look at the big picture. I'm going to show you those comments, the date of those comments in the next chart, but I'm going to pull back and pan out to maybe 1980, and let's see what, what happened if they were right. Oops! They were wrong. The kooks were right. Ladies and gentlemen, it was the kooks that were right. Look at the price rise in silver. Those who were predicting a 10x rise in silver were wrong. It went 12x. Okay, the kooks were right then. So if you're a kook today, okay, we have a very similar situation setting up today. A falling silver price surrounded by catalysts. So what I think is happening is the silver price is coiling. The spring is getting tighter in silver. We've seen this movie before, all right? So where is silver headed? Here's some projections for you. If you averaged all those bull market spikes I first showed you, it'd be $85. If it matched the 1980 peak, once it breaks out, it'd be $252. If you adjusted for the CPI, uh, oh, I'm sorry, CPI, it would be $175. If it matched the S&P 500 ratio in 2011, uh, the middle point of the S&P falling, silver rising, the middle point there would be 93. If it matched the 1980 ratio, it would be $500. If it matched GDP growth, if it just matched GDP growth from 1980, it'd be $400. If 2% of MZM came in, MZM is the broadest major of currency supply that we have. If 2% of MZM came in, it'd be $400, it'd be, excuse me, $250. As Mike has been saying, very few funds own silver. Hardly any institutional investors own silver at this point in time. What happens when they do? Rick Rule, if silver merely returns to its mean, the price triples. Keith Newmeyer, $100 silver is coming. Next coin, what's the common theme from all those prices right there? What's the one thing all those prices have in common? Can anybody tell me? They're all going up, they're all green, but tell me something else about them. What do all those prices signal? New high, who said that? Come and get it. Yeah, every single one of those prices would represent a new high in the silver price. Can you catch? All right. Whoop. Oh, you got to give it back. You, did, you dropped it. Okay. The bottom line is, could there be a more favorable scenario or setup right now for silver than what we have right now? This is even superior to the catalyst they had back in the 1970s. Again, they had all those catalysts back then. The silver price fell, but it coiled. And I think that's what's happening today. Run, you have runaway currency creation. I like how Alex Daly, president of Gold Silver, puts it. We're all peso millionaires. There's plenty of currency sloshing around, but it's all losing purchasing power. It's eroding, right? Unpayable debt levels, record deficit spending. A lot of people don't know this, but the deficit spending we're doing right now is the largest in U.S. history, as per the government website. Uh, negative interest rates, when is all this going to happen again? I think it probably could be when uncertainty and fear strike again and when the mainstream leaves the stock market and starts to shift over into hard assets. 
Okay, let's talk about mining stocks. Why do we invest in mining stocks? Leverage. That's my new favorite bumper sticker. I heart leverage. We can get leverage with mining stocks, right? That's what we want. That's the silver price, the spikes that it had in those years. 53% across the top row there in 2016, 17% in 2019, 140% last year. But look what this, each of these silver stocks did. Every single one of these outperformed silver by a multiple. And in the bottom row there, I just averaged those four companies um, <clears throat> and what their leverage was to silver. You can see 8.7 times the silver price in 2016. They outperformed silver in 2019 by 6.9 times. Last year by 1.6 times. Mining stocks give us leverage. But how do we get that leverage? We want to go to companies that have the most leverage to the silver price. So this is from BMO. It's this year. It's current. And this shows the amount of revenue that each of these companies gets from silver. All right. Notice only five companies currently get more than 50% of their revenue from silver. Okay. Pan American Silver. Love the company. Ross Beatty company, right? Nothing wrong with it. But Pan American Silver only gets roughly a quarter of its revenue from silver. So what I think is going to happen is there's going to be other people who come along, institutional investors, who look at this chart and go, silver is screaming toward $50. How can we get the most leverage to silver? They're going to look at this chart and go, hmm, I think we could get more leverage to the silver price with the companies on the left side of this chart than we can with the companies on the right side of this chart. And I think that's where they're going to go. And notice that the five companies, Gatos, Endeavor, Silver Corp, First Majestic, Go Gold, they're all small producers except for First Majestic. So a lot of institutional investors are going to probably crowd into that stock because it has the highest liquidity, right? The primary silver industry is tiny. What happens when they start to come over? <clears throat> that's the market cap of the S&P on the left there, $23 trillion. There's the Dow, $6 trillion. NASDAQ, $9 trillion. There's the primary silver producers on the left. I had to ask, ask my chart creator to actually put a little gray line in there so it's visible. It actually is not visible on a chart. Okay, you would have to make the chart a lot bigger to make it visible. That's how small the primary silver industry is, the producers. Okay, so, but that's not really a fair comparison because that's not all stocks, okay, those three indices. That's not all stocks. What would be more accurate is to compare it to all stocks. And probably the biggest one we have is the Wilshire 5000, okay? So what I want to show you, ladies and gentlemen, is the primary silver industry to the Wilshire 5000. You ready? There it is. Can you see it? Look, ladies and gentlemen, can you see it? <coughs> there it is. I see it. Can you see it? It is. That's the Wilshire 5000 market cap. That little itsy bitsy teeny weeny yellow polka dot bikini to the left of that red arrow is the primary silver industry. That's how small it is. Now, I'm not saying all that capital is going to come over into silver, not even half of it. 20% is not going to come over. What about 10%? You think 10% might come? If the stock market's crashing, silver's screaming to 50, what about 5%? 2%? Okay, 1%. 1% of the Wilshire decides to come into the silver market. There it is. The silver primary producer industry is a little gray dot. The Wilshire, 1% of the Wilshire is 61 times bigger than the primary silver industry. What happens when just a little bit of that capital comes over? I think it gets fun for us. That's what I think. Okay, so we'll get into my picks now. Uh, just a few disclosures. Everything I'm going to give you, I do own, so full disclosure on that. But these are the ones that I think are the best buys right now. Um, <clears throat> I do recommend you take a Lay's approach. You can't buy just one. Make your own little fund out of them if you want. Uh, buy in pullbacks and tranches, and I do tend to speculate a little bit more in smaller companies. But first out of the gate is First Majestic Silver. I really like this company. Anybody who knows me knows I like this company a lot. And part of the reason is because that chart I showed you, the leverage. They have high leverage to silver, right? Um, I know management. I've been to their uh, mines. I was at Jarrett Canyon just uh, a week or two ago. Um, <clears throat> excuse me.
excuse me, that asset is going to grow production by about 35% so far. The dilution was only 13%, so it was an accretive uh, acquisition. A lot of people don't know this, but First Majestic Silver is actually Eric Sprott's biggest investment. He's put more of his capital into First Majestic than any other mining company, okay, over half a billion dollars. Irma Tanya is going to grow production at Santa Elena by about 50% starting next year. It's going to be a, a huge jump in production there. A lot of companies, uh, excuse me, a lot of analysts cover the company. And if you look at all their reports, they have all different kinds of projections, what they think this, what they think that, right? But there's one thing they all agree on. Production's going higher and costs are going to come down. And that's exactly what you want in a silver company, right? They all agree on that fact. Uh, there's going to be more M&A. Many people said count on it being a silver asset. In my opinion, First Majestic is an easy hold through the bull market. Why? Strong management team. <clears throat> They're operating in pro mining jurisdictions, working on mega silver and gold deposits with their eye on more. That's exactly what you want in a company, right? I was at the Jarrett Canyon mine just a couple weeks ago, and I'm sh including that picture because I wanted you to see just how big this is. You can see the entrance to the mine, the adit in the background at ground level uh, over my shoulder there. That's the pit. Look how big the pit is. It was huge. It was like inside a giant football stadium. It used to be an open pit. Now it's an underground mine. And the, the great thing about First Majestic is this is they've done this before. They've bought mines, refurbished them, optimized them, turned them around. They're like turnaround experts for the mining industry, right? You can see on the left there, they've, the acquisition closed like five months ago. They've already identified over 25 drill targets at Jarrett Canyon. This mine has been in operation for 40 years. There's probably another 40 years of mine life left in there. <clears throat> probably outlived me. I'm not sure how I feel about that. Okay, <clears throat> and here's a good example of charting that uh, Steve does at Silver Chartist. But I put it up there so you can see that the risk-reward uh, balance for the stock right now is actually at a good entry point, okay? Lower risk, higher reward. So <coughs> if you're interested in the stock, that's a good entry point. <coughs> okay, let's get into the developers. Silvercrest Metals, it's hard not to like this company. They're building the La Chispa mine down in Mexico now. It's high grade. Eric Fire <coughs> and his team are very experienced. I've met him. I've interviewed him multiple times. I really like him. I think this is his sixth mine that he's building. So they kind of know what they're doing. They've done this before, <laughs> okay? Uh, let's, the IRR, the internal rate of return at La Chispa is 52%, very robust. They're about one year away from production, so they're in Louis James's sweet spot right now, the pre-production sweet spot, he calls it, right? So it's basically buying a stock from construction decision to first pour. That's the sweet spot because stocks get re-rated when they go into production, okay? It's not just silver companies, it's any miner, okay? You're in there right now. So from construction decision to first pour, you have a 90% chance of a 90% return within that 18-month period of time. This is well-documented. Louis was the first one to do comprehensive studies on this. So it's a great time to buy this stock. They're still exploring La Chispa. is going to be huge probably. There's over 30 unexplored veins they haven't even looked at yet. The stock's in very strong hands. Look at the left. Institutional holdings is 71%. Okay, so if you see the stock going down, it's not them selling. It's weak retail hand selling, all right? And then on the right, the stock's very undervalued. Again, there'll be a re-rating. That's the price to NAV. That's its peers on the left and, and Silvercrest on the, on, or its peers on the right, excuse me. So there's going to be a re-rating when this stock does go into production. So it's in that sweet spot. Production will start about a year from now. And then, of course, Discovery Silver. The reason I like Discovery Silver is, first, Cordero is one of the largest undeveloped silver projects in the entire world, okay? Over a billion ounce silver equivalent right now. They have a three-tier advantage, too. They're not just big, it's not just high grade, but it's also um, at surface. It's gonna be an open pit mine. Open pits are cheaper to operate, lower cost, than underground mines. Uh, they just completed metallurgical testing. The silver recoveries were 80 to 89%. That's very good. The stock was recently added to both GDXJ and SILJ. SILJ. Eric Sprout owns 25% of Discovery Silver. So that's what he thinks of the stock. 
uh, there's demonstrated, this stock has demonstrated strong leverage to a rising silver price. So <clears throat> this is one you want to hold to a production. They're further behind than Silvercrest, so it's going to be a few years before they're into production. If you buy it, you want to hold till then. And this is the 15 largest undeveloped silver deposits in the world, and look who's number two, Cordero, Discovery Silvers. Okay, I like Go Gold. It's kind of a hybrid right now because they're in production. They're also in exploration. They're also in development. Uh, Peral's producing probably about 2.5 million ounces uh, down there this year. But they're using the, the revenue from that to fund their uh, exploration at Los Ricos. There's Lo Los Ricos North, another deposit Los Ricos South. They have 108 million ounce silver equivalent resource right now. It's probably going higher. Why do I say that? They're drilling 110,000 meters, that's not a misprint, at Los Ricos North this year. So the basic question being asked there is, how big is this thing? They're going to find out. Los Ricos South already has an IR of 46%, very robust. Insiders own 20% of this stock, so their interests are well aligned with ours, seeing a higher stock price. Uh, the stock has been one of the few that has done actually very well this year. It's up. So if you buy it, and I do like this company a lot, it's showing a lot of strength, uh, make sure you do it only on down days or dips or something like that. Um, I also think that Gogo is probably a takeover target. And of course, if it's taken over, it gets bought out at a premium. This is the history with, <coughs> excuse me, Brad Gill and his team. There are other companies that have been bought out all at a premium. So I think the same thing is probably gonna happen to Gogo. That's me saying that, not them. All right, let's get into the explorers. First up is BlackRock Silver. I like this company. They're drilling Tonopah West right now. It is the second largest silver district in Nevada. The old timers used to be working there. They mined and it was all high grade. And so far, BlackRock has outlined 10 mineralized veins. It's, according to management, the most active silver project right now in all the US. And when they report uh, their results, a lot of them, the last six results weren't reported in grams, they weren't reported in ounces, they were reported in kilograms, okay? Kind of like Silvercrest, uh, La Chispa mine down for Silvercrest, right? Um, and that's over 32 ounces. Um, and, and ironically, some analysts are comparing this mine, uh, not mine, this project to La Chispa down in Mexico because it has high grade silver with gold credits, okay? So that's very interesting. This could be a robust mine, we'll see. There's an initial resource coming out in next uh, quarter. It could surprise the market. That's me saying that, not them. Um, this is highly respected management. One of the uh, people, I, one of the geos in Nevada I trust most, I asked him about management here and he had nothing but praise to say about them so they know what they're doing. Stocks in strong hands, less than a third is owned by retail. So here it is. This is some of the reports uh, drill intercepts they've uh, reported with on the map. The red is all the drill intercepts. You can see some are good grade, some are high grade, some are very high grade, okay? So the question is, does all of this connect up? It's kind of all over the place, right? So the question, and this is, this is me saying this, not management, does this connect up? If this connects up, I think look out above. So you can talk more to them about it. They're here. See what you think. Next is Raina Silver. I like this company because this is a Peter McGaugh. He was a co-founder of MAG. He's also a co-founder here of Raina. There were two assets, if you don't know, that were pushed out of uh, uh, MAG into Raina. Uh, the flagship GG is the largest known CRD carbonate replacement deposit in Mexico. That's according to Peter. Peter knows what he's talking about because he did his PhD on this area in Mexico. So if he's right, this could be something special. Uh, they just completed a 12,000 meter drilling campaign. As the labs are backed up, right, for most people. Um, so assays are pending. They should be out pretty soon. Institutions own 40% of this stock. Management owns 17%. This is a speculation. But if they find what they think they're going to find, this has explosive potential. Uh, and here's how explosive it could be. If they find the source of the system, this is the market cap of companies. There's Raina down near the bottom in the gold bar. So if they find something, look at the re-rating that could take place with this company if Peter McGaugh is right. I think there's a good chance that he will be. Okay, next up is Lakewood Exploration. They have three highly prospective silver properties. So 
I'm on a tour with them about two months ago, and go and see the Silver Strand Mine. I know some of you here went and saw it. So they have the Silver Strand Mine, and there's a five and a half kilometer strike between Silver Strand and the other project, Burnt Cabin. Five and a half kilometer strike. Looks very perspective. Um, the thing that's compelling about it is they've only drilled it to about 90 meters. That's it. But all the mines in the area have been drilled to 2,000 meters and found silver, found mineralization. There was one drill intercept below 90 meters back in 1997, and that hit was over 1,900 grams per ton silver. Okay? So we think there's a good chance there's going to be more silver below, and that's exactly what they're going to do. Um, drilling has just started. They're starting, I think, as we speak right now. <laughs> I think it's starting today. So I get back from the tour, and I get this press release in less than a month saying, we bought two more projects. And I'm like, what? I, I thought, you're going to lose focus, right? But it turns out these are actually just as perspective, if not more, than Silver Strand. They were actually, management said, too good to pass up. The first one is Eliza, or Eliza down in Nevada. It actually caused a silver rush in Nevada back in the day. You've heard the gold rush in California. This one caused actually a silver rush. The old miners back then were mining over 2,500 grams per ton in the 1800s with no modern you, you know, uh, equipment, right? <clears throat> and there's a government document they found. So the old miner, there's the fault. The old timers were working up here, and there was another little mine down here that actually didn't really operate. But there's an old government document that says the California mine uh, was the most noted mine south of the fault. It hadn't gotten a lot of attention, but they found it had as much as 5,600 to 18,000 grams per ton silver. This, th this is over 100 years ago, right? It's never been drilled. It's seen no modern exploration whatsoever. Lots of silver at top means there's a good chance lots of silver below. So we'll see. It's a speculation, but boy, it looks really compelling. They're mapping and sampling now. Then there's Silverton down near Tonopah where Blackrock is also working. Uh, it was also a past producing mine, high grade. Again, see no modern exploration whatsoever. So one reason I like this stock is it's an early stage company. So it is early stage. So it's, more for, it's more of a speculation, right? But I like it because it's an early stage. It's a chance for us retail investors to get into a new silver company that's exploring three highly prospective properties by a strong technical team. I've met them. There's not just one geo. There's multiple geos on staff here that's not yet caught the eye of big investors. Institutions can't even buy this yet because the market cap is $18 million. It's ridiculously low. So if they find something, the market cap of this thing could be explosive. It could 10x and it would still only be $100 million. Again, it's a speculation, but we'll see. Oh, and by the way, there's a name change coming. You can talk to them about it at the booth, but they're going to be called Silver Hammer Mining Company. Okay, then GR Silver. Okay, the Palamosis resource has 80 million ounces silver equivalent. I just reported that. The resource comes out, and the grade was low. In fact, it was too low. So why would I be talking, why do I own this stock? Why would I keep owning this stock? Why would I highlight it here at a conference? Several reasons. One, that resource included historic results before current management got a hold of it, and a lot of the hits that were done back then were zero. There was no mineralization in them. But management felt it was important to include the whole thing. So they did. So you add all those zero hits in there, that obviously drags the average down, right? But this has been a mine before on one of the locations of this property. They've actually mined there before. And the mining then was 190 grams per ton silver plus a gram of gold for a credit. Okay, so we know that there's higher grade silver in the area. Also, right now they're drilling outside of the resource where the resource estimate is and they're drilling 100 meters below where the previous drills have gone. There's seven drills turning right now. I just talked to management last week. Seven drills are turning right now on this property. Uh, the other thing is this stock is dirt cheap. The in situ value of that asset, of the resource so far is 1.8 billion at current silver prices. If you take 10% of that, you take 10% because it takes a lot of capital to dig that silver up, right? So you take 10%, 10% of that would be $180 million. The market cap of the company is about 52. So, 
$180 million value with a stock at $52 million. The stock is clearly, by almost any measure, undervalued. Oh, and, and I found out last month, First Majestic just bought into it. They own almost 13% of the company. Hmm. And they also bought some BlackRock, too, by the way. So they obviously see something compelling there. This is the, a map of their areas. The brown is their concessions. The Pomosis mine, the old one I talked was, said was in production before is over there on the right. You'll see some blue splotches. There's Fresnillo operating over there, up there on top. Vizsla, Vizsla had a big silver discovery. Um, so, you know, GR is operating in a good area. They own a large land package. They're aggressively drilling. So this is very prospective in my opinion. So those are what I consider to be my top picks right now. Come on, B. So if you don't want to do that, uh, this is who I follow. You can hire some help and, and have uh, someone else do it for you. Uh, Louis James is long considered my mentor at, when I, back in the day at Casey Research. So I have a lot of respect for him. Uh, his service is called My Take, and it's very inexpensive. You can actually submit requests to him, and he'll give you his take on them. Uh, Brian Lundin's been doing this a long time. <laughs> Uh, and he gave me a special code just for the conference here. So even if you're watching this on video, the code is still good. It's half off. It's goldnewsletter.com slash goldadvisor. If you use that link, it's half off. I believe it's only $99. Uh, Brian focuses a lot on juniors. I got a lot of great ideas out of him every month, so it's worth checking out. And then Silver Chartist, as I, uh, Steve was here earlier, um, I write for them occasionally, so that's a... That's a lot of fun. I write on fundamentals. The team covers technical analysis. There's the price. If you're interested, it's silverchartistadvisor.com to get that price. Use that link right there. And then, of course, you can't go wrong with David Morgan. Is there anybody here that knows more about silver? Well, this gentleman does. But <laughs> I don't invest in silver. <laughs> you don't invest in silver. Shame. <laughs> I do know more about it. <laughs> You can't go wrong with David. I mean, he obviously knows silver uh, as good as anyone. Uh, there's a reason he's called the silver guru, right? And remember, your first party was always physical metal. We could be wrong about stocks. You have to own physical metal. Um, you may need more than just exposure to the price of silver in the coming environment. You may need the actual physical metal, depending on how things play out, right? So your safest bet, obviously, is to own the physical metal. I'm looking at you. <laughs> Gold, silver, I work with Mike Maloney. It's all about education. That's frankly the reason I was hired, was to help write articles, do research, and things like that. It's everything Mike is about. Hidden Secrets of Money, they just told me on Friday, has hit 97 million <laughs> views. <laughs> His Hidden Secrets of Money series, it's crazy. Uh, if you haven't seen it, at least watch episode one, grab some popcorn. These are you know, movie quality productions that really go into the difference between currency and money, and it goes off from there. It's, it, they're great. Uh, you can sign up for our newsletter. If you do, you get all of our research before we release it to the public. We also have a mail-in storage program. One of the few bullion dealers that you can actually mail in bullion to for storage that you already own without having to buy it. So if you want to get some your gold and silver out of the house, I've had gold stolen out of my house before. It was hugely humiliating, embarrassing, angering, all that. Um, so I don't store any in the house anymore. So if you want to get some out, I'm not saying, you know, send it all in. But if you want to get some in storage out of your house, you can do that with our program. There's a link on our site. Uh, if you want help managing your portfolio, Wealthion.com does that. This is Adam Taggart's firm. They, they are on the same pages. That's a nice thing. They're financial planners, um, and they uh, are, are aligned with us. They believe in hard assets. They're skeptical of the Fed. So if you want someone just to do it for you, you can hire them at Wealthion.com and know that they'll be on the same page as, as all of us. Uh, you can follow me at, at Twitter if you want, at the Gold Advisor. So I have one more coin. Why did Mike Maloney make the, I guess, this silver coin? That's my question. But before anybody answers, here's the last slide. So I want you to, there we go. That's the silver price. The silver price in 1976 to 1980. That's what it did. If we match anything reasonable to then, and again, I think the setup is very similar, right? 
we have a falling or frustrating silver price surrounded by catalysts, I think the silver price is coiling. And if we do anything remotely like what happened in the late 1970s, you are here in August 1977. All right. Last coin. Why did Mike Maloney decide to make a Pegasus coin? Why did he want a Pegasus coin made of all silver coins? It's basically a modern ancient. Nope. Well, he thinks that, but why did he, why did he choose a Pegasus coin? Why the Pegasus? Anybody know? Bingo. It was one of the very first symbols on a manufactured silver coin. I think it was like 304 BC. So there you go. Catch. All right. You caught it. You can keep it. All right. Okay. I hope this was useful, helpful for everyone. Thank you. I love being here. And uh, thanks, ladies and gentlemen.